Good morning. Good morning from the Ozarks. Look who I got with me today. <laughs> She's I, on task. I got I got my favorite girl with me today. I'm his only girl. Well, folks. <laughs> I have two other girls. Oh, there is Jennifer. There's, and there's Jennifer Nikki. Andrew Ama, my mm -hmm. daughter. Mm -hmm. My daughters. But you're my main squeeze. Honey, I'm your only squeeze, like <laughs> Sue says. <laughs> we have a friend of ours. He's a Papa Apostle in Branson, Missouri. And he's... Uh, Don Madison. Don Apostle Don Madison. And he's out of that uh, <clears throat> generation. His ministry was, uh, over the years, in the early days of his ministry with the Jesus generation the jesus people and so he's got a lot of the hippie colloquialisms in his mm -hmm. uh, conversation and so he'll get up and make that statement about his wife sue that she's his main squeeze and she'll perk up in the back she says i better be your only squeeze <laughs> after 60 years something like yeah, that 60 years that. <laughs> and he laughs <clears throat> precious couple well it's it's a lovely day in the Ozarks, mm -hmm. and we're just glad to be bringing the Bible study, studying in the book of Exodus. Uh, I can't help when I read the book of Exodus, I just keep seeing Charlton Heston. Uh, when he did... Uh, the movie about Moses and the Exodus. I always see him when I <laughs> read about Pharaoh going visual. in. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, today we have, there's a total of 10 plagues that were visited upon Pharaoh because Pharaoh was resisting letting the people of God go. And we see plagues uh, 7, 8, and 9 today. And the spirit of Pharaoh is alive today. There is a cry for freedom. Among, people want to be free. Uh, sometimes that freedom manifests their character. People get free and, and things crop up in their character that are not in their best interests. But God is so willing and so desiring to bring freedom that he's willing to give them that opportunity. Just like when Peter complained about Paul's teachings. Peter didn't like Paul's teachings. I guarantee you if you went to the Apostle Peter's conferences, you would not find Paul's books on his book table. He said the Apostle Paul wrote many things that the ignorant mm -hmm. and the unlearned did twist to their own destruction. But yet in the same sentence, he admits, he says, as they do other scripture. So he admits the man is writing sacred writ. But, and in the same breath, he says, but I don't like it. <laughs> so why would God allow the apostle Paul from that day till this, his writings have that effect to write things that ignorant people would take and rest, W-R-E-S-T, rest to their own destruction, and unlearned people would take and rest to their own destruction. Why would he do that? Why would God do that? Because, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, he was a, uh, even among, uh, and when you study great literature, people who don't even believe in God, whenever you, you ask them about the great uh, literature of, of the ages uh, in human history, they will almost always include some of the writings of Paul, for instance, the book of Romans, which is considered one of the great uh, pieces of literature of all time. And, uh, but why? When, you know, he was capable of putting it any way God told him to. Why did God have him write in such a way that people would take it, what he wrote and do damage to themselves. Be, the reason is, is that God so desires to liberate everybody in the middle that he's willing to write off the ignorant on one hand and the unlearned on the other hand. 
in order to empower everybody else. It is so important that the power of the gospel get get a, pounding on the ledge here. Get, a, get activated in your life that God is willing to leave open the opportunity for people. I saw that in the early days of my ministry, Kitty. Uh, it was 30 years ago the Lord showed me John 5, 19. Do what you see the Father do. Mm-hmm. And oh, that just got a hold of me. And it actually came to me in a, in a correction that he was giving me. I was, he was correcting me in an area and, uh, and he showed this to me and it revolutionized my life and I began to preach my heart out. John five nineteen. Do what was the key to Jesus' success? Because mm-hmm. the Scripture says plainly, in Romans chapter one, it says that Jesus was defined as the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. That then He turned around and gave to us. Mm-hmm. So what that means is He didn't use His secret decoder ring as the Son of God to do the things He did. He limited Himself in His humanity to only doing things by the Holy Spirit, then then he gave us the Holy Ghost to go do the same thing, and then he told us, you're going to do greater things. We haven't done that yet, but we're going to. We are. And so, uh, what was the key? How come Jesus had such a, 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 a better track record, raising the dead, healing the sick, etc., than we do today? Because he only did what he saw the Father do. And he only spoke as he heard the Father speak. And he said, he said, as I hear, I judge. The word judge means make a decision. Now, we make a decision. We weigh everything out. We consult our counselors. We look at our checkbook. Jesus didn't look at his checkbook when he needed to make a decision. He looked in his spirit. And as the Father spoke, he even said, he said, my doctrine is not my own, but his that sent me. <laughs> now, you stop and think about that. That'll twist your mind a little bit. He said, my doctrine is not my own. One of the questions I want to ask Jesus (laughs) when I get to heaven after a couple of million years uh, is, well, if it would have been up to you, what would you have taught? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But when God showed that to me, John 5, 19, I preached it and I saw a young man go out and destroy himself with that teaching. And became totally obstinate, unteachable. You couldn't reach him. And he was, he was, I was his pastor, but I also considered him a friend. And I reached out to him. And it hurt me for his sake. And I asked the Lord about it. And the Lord said, yes, you're telling people to go and do what they see the Father do. But not everybody's Father is God. Mm. Not everybody's listening to God the Father. Some of them are listening to their stepdaddy the devil. Wow. He said, and it's so important to get that message out that you have to be willing to see people do that and take the criticism for it because I was being criticized and teaching something un- <laughs> unsafe. I get that a lot. <laughs> i got to tell this fun story. It's along the lines of doing what you see somebody do. I uh, have always been big on, since I raised my kids and, and um, just dedicated it to the Lord from their conception, I had... Um, Andrew and uh, Jennifer and um, I was always big on making a memory so I did things that my kids will tell you today if you ask them tell us one of the memories your mom made and um, there's some funny stuff that happened and out of the ordinary things they would never forget and they told their children so now I have a grandson who Gabriel was about four he's now going on 19 when he was four um, the, the thing was always making a memory with nanny making a memory So Jennifer, my daughter, heard a crash when um, Gabriel was four one day, and uh, she went into the bedroom to find Gabriel on the floor, and he'd had his daddy's long leather belt, and he had tied it to the top of the bunk and jumped off thinking he was Superman. And when she walked in the room, she said, son, are you okay? Yes. Well, what were you doing? I was just making a memory like Nanny. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, you want to be careful who you emulate and and what you do with the information God's given you. Exactly but I think right. it's a really good challenge. It has been in my life to do just what we see the Father do because it's always right. It's always well, and, right. And part of that, too, is learning to live with criticism because Paul's teachings were controversial in his day. And we look back, oh, he's St. Paul. You know, well, Paul was criticized. Paul established churches 
such as the Corinthian churches, and then later on in his life, we find he goes back to them and say, well, Paul, in order for us to let you come preach, we need a letter of recommendation. Oh, my goodness. And the whole book of Second Corinthians is him railing on that, the fact that they were demanding that of him, because it just kind of pushed his button, tweaked his melon. And, <laughs> and, uh, and likewise today, you know, everybody wants to play it safe. Uh, too many times ministry is about marching in place till Jesus comes, mm -hmm. preaching coping <coughs> strategies that people are taught not to th thrive. They're taught just to survive and play it safe because rules are made by elders that want to get to bed early. But God's not interested. He, God is not so invested in still waters and green pastures that he's unwilling for you to get up, shake yourself, grab, go, grab Goliath's sword, and go lop the giant's head off. For every church that has a building fund, they should have a bail fund equivalent to the same amount. Because we're called to go out and to shake this world for Jesus. It's not about bedding down the sheep. It's about activating warriors to go out and do what God told you to do. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, you're going to get criticized by people that think that without their credibility and endorsement, you'll never be anything in the kingdom. And trust me, we've had them sit down and tell us, if you don't have our approval, you not only would we not be successful in their city, they said, you'll never do anything in the kingdom if you don't have our approval. <laughs> and so just because somebody is criticizing, I tend to, to watch the websites like Apostasy Watch and all of that. That's where I f found people like Graham Cook and different <laughs> ones because I go, I go look and say, let's see who the naysayers are criticizing and let me go find out because they probably got something under the hood. They're probably doing something for God. Don't give me the guy that's going to play it safe. <laughs> give, me, give me the man or the woman that are willing to put something on the line and willing to risk their reputation in order to step out and do something for God because here's what I found out. God even makes your mistakes to prosper. Right. <laughs> Especially in the prophetic one, I know that from experience, when you step out to do something, you hear the Lord say it, He confirms it to you. Um, <clears throat> so often, the criticism that comes tries to shake you off the foundation of did you really hear but you better know buddy you better know you heard when you step because that's the confidence he's gonna meet you on that water that you're walking on he'll meet you there and he'll deal with your enemies he'll just say come on come on just keep coming we're gonna seek the kingdom and ignore that stuff but if not then you're sh you're so shaken you look down at your circumstances and you begin to wonder did you hear and that's one of the biggest traps that the spirit of Jezebel that Jezebel does is try to get you off that track that God put you on <laughs> now Moses is confronting Pharaoh continually here and I want you to read approximately the first 15 verses of chapter 10 here in Exodus everybody and the Lord said to Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's sons what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. And they said, I'm sorry, they shall fill thy house, houses and the houses of thy servants and the houses of the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor their fathers' fathers have seen since the day they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought in again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and their, with our herds. We will go, for we must hold 
a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so, go now that ye are men and serve the Lord, for they that did I'm sorry, for that they that ye did desire that they were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the land, even all the that the hail had left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the Egypt and rested on the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the field and the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field uh, through the land of Egypt. There's two verses we want to look at here. One of them is in verse 3 and the other one is verse 8 and 9. What's God after with Pharaoh? He said, how long before you humble yourself before me? The spirit of Pharaoh is alive and well today. People would rather lie, break the law, do anything but humble themselves. I know here in the United States, if you want to commit political suicide, just give a heartfelt apology. And it's one thing you'll see. Every time a man gets in uh, the executive office, gets in the presidency, you will never see that man ever. Even when he's caught red-handed, doing, having done something absolutely contrary to maybe a promise that he had made or just made a really bad blunder, you will never see him come out and say, I, I am so sorry, please forget, forgive me. And uh, because that's the spirit of Pharaoh. See, in those days, the people said, uh, I want to be free. God said, let my people go. And the spirit of Pharaoh says, oh, you want to be free? Well, you just, you're just idle. You're just being idle-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, let me make it harder on you. Go make bricks without straw. Today, when people want to be free, you know it in, by looking at the economy. You know people want to be free when they start taking their money and putting it in savings accounts. <coughs> And when money goes into savings accounts, that's measured and gets reported on Wall Street. And they say consumer confidence is low because you're not spending money. Mm -hmm. and instead, you're saving money. So consumer confidence is low. Oh, and so the big Fortune 500 companies start laying people off. They say, oh, you want to be free? Make payments without jobs. Because they're going to have that which you're wanting to deploy in another purpose. And so the spirit of Pharaoh in that day said, make bricks without straw. The spirit of Pharaoh today says, make payments without jobs. And it's all fueled by pride. God was giving Pharaoh an out in the area of his greatest weakness. And his weakness was his pride. That's why God's greatest strength is always made manifest in your greatest weakness. You're trying to get rid of your weakness. God doesn't want to get rid of your weakness. He wants to manifest his strength in your weakness. Mm -hmm. And he was in Pharaoh's way out was at his point of greatest vulnerability. If you want to get free and you want to avoid the negative aspects of circumstances like Pharaoh was going through, the key is to humble yourself. There is a verse, I, I don't, it's in Kings, where it's talking about uh, this one particular king, I believe it was Amos. Uh, is one of the most wicked kings, the scripture said, that uh, before or after him there was not a more wicked king. And the prophet went to him by the word of the Lord and said, uh, your, your wives are going to be ravaged in front of you. Your children are going to be slain in front of you. I'm going to put out your eyes. I'm going to destroy you because you are a wicked king. And then the prophet turns around in a huff and he heads for the door. And before the prophet can get out of the palace, the king takes his crown off of his head, rips his garment, and falls on the ground and begins to wail. And God stops the prophet. He's got his hand on the door. He's going out in a huff. He's had his blaze of glory. And God stops him and says, it's like God taps the prophet on the shoulder. He says, did you see what he did? Mm -hmm. Did you see what he did? He humbled himself before his entire court. Mm -hmm. You go back and tell him, 
it, that I won't do it in his lifetime. And there was no record that that king ever, he didn't reform. He didn't become a good king after that. Mm -hmm. But his humility, the Bible says that God inhabits a place of hum with him, that, uh, the high and lofty place with him that is of a humble and a contrite spirit. Mm -hmm. You want to know what your most, greater than prayer, greater than any other, greater than intercession, greater than hours of praying in tongues, greater than than fasting, man, I fasted 40 days, three times in my life. I fasted long fast, 10 days, 20 days, many times in my life. I believe in doing that. But the most powerful thing that I've ever, that I've ever seen in my own personal life, and I have to tell you what I've seen and heard. This may not be the truth, but it is a truth. A truth. And it's my personal truth. It's what I've experienced. Humility provokes the hand of God Amen. more powerfully and quicker <clears throat> than anything else. Fasting is about humbling yourself. You humble your belly. Your belly wants a hamburger and you say, no, you're not getting a hamburger till we get a breakthrough with God. Then you bring your belly into agreement with your spirit, your flesh into agreement with your spirit. The Bible says the, f the flesh is enmity with the spirit. Here's how you bring your flesh into agreement. <laughs> you tell your flesh, you're not getting a hamburger till we get a breakthrough with God. And you create, a, you create a Matthew 18 agreement between your flesh and your spirit. And when two come are agreed, nothing shall be impossible to them. And you get instant breakthrough. That's the whole point it's, of fasting, folks. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so that long. So he wants Pharaoh. Pharaoh's out was humi humility. And I want you to think about these plagues. Thousands of people have died. Thousands more are about to die when the final plague comes. Did God not love these people? Of course he did. Let me give you an idea of what, what happened. In Acts chapter 12, the apostle Peter is taken to jail. And they, they, he's so dangerous to Herod that Herod had him surrounded by 18 soldiers. He was chained to 18 soldiers. Because he was dangerous. And in the night, the angel comes in and gets him out, slips him out of his chains, takes him out to the city. And these 18 soldiers wake up and Peter's gone. Now listen to me. Now think about it. 18 people chained to one guy. The next morning, the guy's gone. Why? Because God set him free. But what happened to those 18 guys? Acts 12, 19 says that Herod commanded that those men be put to death. So 18 people died because God broke Peter out of jail. Did God not love those 18 people? No, they were just on the wrong side of the sovereignty of God. Now let me give you something that will make you think. There are times that in your lifetime, if you walk with God, that God's going to do things for you and in you that are going to have repercussions in the lives of others that they're not going to appreciate mm -hmm. because people put themselves on the wrong side of what God's going to do. And then this, the timing gets to the point where God says, that's it, I'm not waiting any longer. And he's going to bring you to deliverance. That's where the scripture, he told Abraham, I'm going to bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. That word curse those that curse you, it means I will execrate them. Emphasis on the word excrement. He said, I will execrate them from your life. And there are people you don't ever want to be, choose not to be a blessing to somebody. You, he said, Abraham, you want to be a blessing. That's how Abraham keeps from being execrated out of somebody's life. Sure. You are, first of all, to be a blessing. And if you will be a blessing, <laughs> okay, then God will cause you to be blessed. He said, because those that curse you, the word curse there means trifle with you. That when the people would curse Abraham, he said, and what it actually meant was Abraham, even those that trifle with you, I'm going to execrate out of your life. <laughs> so it's not, and I, let me tell you something. Kitty and I have had people that wanted to do a whole lot more than trifle with us. We had people that to this day we have people that call for our death. They they just they hate the prophetic, and they don't like to see the voice. Of what, they don't think it's the voice of God. They think it's something else, and so they delight in speaking against 
us and and even when they can doing things to, to harm us in some way it's never been successful but what it has done is it's brought circumstances and consequences into their life that were not God's plan mm -hmm. God loved those 18 soldiers mm -hmm. But you don't ever want to get on the wrong side of the blessing of God in somebody's life. And, uh, and you'll see that happen. And the Lord has had me share this with several people as we've prophesied over the years. Just as we've never taken credit, we, we, we must never take credit for any of the good things that God does. All the glory goes to God. Um, neither must we take any responsibility for what happens when a person gets on the wrong side of God. When they change their course and they're fighting God, um, you can call them a Christian if you want to. But I believe if they were truly Christ-like, they wouldn't be getting uh, in territory that God had blessed and crossing a line. So you don't have to take any responsibility for that. Don't don't spend any time you can you can pray blessing but you don't spend any time when you observe that something has gone awry because the people the person has chosen to go in a wrong direction and the key is humility humility right. when you humble yourself my dad uh, one of his pastors when he was a young kid he'd given his life to the Lord and he really thought a lot of his pastor and but his pastor was a uh, reformed hitman came out of prison. He was a, a hitman for the mob in his in his previous life, and uh, he and so this man had a rough background. And one day, my dad was around the church, and the pastor was in there painting or doing something, and must have hit his hand with a hammer or something, and he cursed. And uh, my dad, you know, twelve, thirteen years old, here's his pastor acting in a very unchristlike manner. And the Lord spoke to my dad. And it was so typical. What blessed me when I heard him say what God told him, it's just typical of how God has spoken to my father in all of his life. He says, get your eyes off of man and keep them on God. You know, and here's the danger. Whenever you say, well, I don't ever want to trifle with anybody, but, well, here's when you know you're getting in uh, the danger zone. The story of Peter... Uh, when Jesus, uh, the last few, chapter of John, when Peter, uh, the Lord was saying, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then right after that, you know, Peter's like, well, you know, I'll love you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then right after that, Peter points at John and says, hey, what's this man going to do? Mm -hmm. He says, if I, Jesus said, if I want him to sit there till I come, what business is that of yours? Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul says, it's a small thing to me if you're going to judge me. He says, I don't even judge myself. But when Jesus shows up, every man's going to receive praise of God. And that word praise means to appraise like a jeweler. Mm -hmm. And jewels are formed by heat and pressure. <laughs> and it's not just talking about when Jesus comes at the end of time. It's talking about when Jesus shows up in your situation. Amen. You don't ever want to put yourself. At, but we don't start out trying to work against God's blessing in somebody's life. We have all kinds of justifications, but we need to learn to get our mouth off of others. I like what one preacher said one time. Lafayette, Louisiana was a real, back years ago, was a real hotbed of church strife because churches were just busting out the seams and big churches were growing up and a lot of people were shifting between congregations and uh, a lot of a lack of unity between uh, the, the pastors. And this one evangelist who was loved by many of the pastors was asked by one of the pastor buddies, he said, what do you think of that pastor across town? He said, if I was him, I would do exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, and then he confided in me, he says, now I'm not him and I wouldn't do anything that he's doing. Mm -hmm. But if I was him, I'd do it just that way. Sure. <laughs> sure. Now, the 10 plagues, what was there... Uh, a method behind the madness of the ten plagues that God sent upon Egypt. Now remember that the spirit of Egypt is alive and well today. Why do you think the economies of the world... Well, you know, it is not money like a secular God in our culture? And look at the economies of the world faltering. Look at the nations of the world, the armies of the world, struggling. You know, people have looked... We see this... I get calls all the time from, uh, from Africa... And uh, they'll call me up and tell me what a great man of God I am. And they want Kitty and I to come to Africa. And they want to know how much money we're bringing. 
when we come. And I've had people who've immigrated from, from Africa, from India, and they would say, you don't understand. They bring the same people over and over to get born again and to fill your meetings because they know you're going to leave money behind when you go. And so for <clears throat> generations, and now the United States is descending out of third world, of, out of uh, superpower status. And, and, their, and their popularity in the earth is not the same as it once was. And we'll have people call up from Kenya and from different places. And this isn't true of all of them, and there are ministries we support mm -hmm. in, in Africa right. and are happy to do it. And we've sent lots of money uh, to, to help or orphanages and stuff like that, but not all of them. And they'd call up and tell us what great man and woman of God we are, and I would say, okay, I'm coming uh, to Africa. I said, but I need you to know that when I come, I'm bringing my anointing. I'm not bringing my checkbook. Click. Because they weren't wanting the God in me. They wanted what was in my wallet. They didn't want what was in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so God <laughs> is tearing down these idols. And each one of the ten plagues that were visited upon Egypt was a direct assault on an idol that they worshipped. Now let me give you the ten plagues. Water turned to blood, frogs, lice, flies, Disease on cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the death of the firstborn. Those were the ten plagues. Well, each one of those ten plagues, the water turned to flood, turned to blood, was an assault on Kunim, Hapai, and Osiris. These were gods of the Nile. The frogs, there was a frog goddess called Happy that that was against. Lice, the lice came out of the dust of the earth. Seb was the earth god of Egypt. Flies, they worshipped a fly god called Uetjit. Uh, disease on cattle, Hathor was the god, Egyptian god associated with bulls and cows. Boils, Imhotep was the Egyptian god of healing. Hail, Isis was the uh, agricultural god. Nut was the Egyptian sky goddess. Locust, Serapia was a specific god protecting specifically against locusts. Darkness, uh, Horus was the Egyptian sun god, and Thoth was, was the Egyptian moon god. And then, of course, the death of the firstborn. Each one of those plagues was an assault by God showing that those were unspeaking idols and that there was only one God that was, that was to be worshipped. And it was interesting that in this time frame... Uh, uh, that all of this was happening, there had been a Pharaoh who had come to power and said, there is only one God, and he banished all of these gods, and he was assassinated. And now God sends Moses, the leader of a, of a generation of slaves, to bring all of these gods to their judgment. I believe that the Egyptian God that I mean, the Egyptian Pharaoh that worshipped one God, he was probably sent by God. He, didn't, he may not have known the God of the Hebrews, but he was sensing after something. And uh, something for us to, to think about and to consider. And just like today, all of the gods, all of the things, the cult of celebrity. Mm -hmm. uh, think about the, how even in uh, uh, all, uh, the, the larger-than-life figures... Uh, in our society are just shamed. They're shamed right and left. Their lives. They, they hire, there's a whole multi-million dollar industry that's about dealing with the exposure of sh the shameful lives of people that we consider celebrities. Why? God is exposing. The, the, uh, the condition of our economies, same way, the God of money is being exposed. Money is not the answer to all things. And we see this where in the great politicians and wise men of our day are unable to solve the problems. What's the answer? Humility. God wants to prosper. What, how are we going to prosper? Believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. Second Chronicles 20.20. 20. But, but the prophets are not, not in and of themselves the key to prosperity, but they are the key to prosperity in that they bring the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord for the U.S.? What's the word of the Lord for the U.K.? What's the word of the Lord for the nations of the earth? God has a path of progress, and if we find out what it is and follow it, but, but again, here in the United States, that's one thing that's grieved me, 
is the absolute refusal. Even in 911, uh, whenever all of the, the devastation that took place in our country, there was no repentance. There was no spirit of repentance. There was not even a real plea to God. It was just shaking their fist and rattling their saber, we're going to go get the bad guys, rather than calling out to God and saying, God, help us understand what's happening uh, in, in our midst. Time to remember the first commandment. If you want to know what's, what's God saying about your nation, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's exactly right. That's the bottom line. And uh, so if you'd go ahead and read 15 <clears throat> through the end of the... I did 15, shall uh, I 16, 16 through, through the end? Through the end, yes. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. That's after all the locusts locust covered. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sins, only this once, and entreat the Lord your God, that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward the heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord, let your flocks and your herds be stayed, let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifice and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle shall go with us, and there shall not be a hoof left behind, be left behind, and thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more. For in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. If you want to know where the idols are in our culture, think about all of the... God told me this one time. He says, If you want to identify an idol, look at all the places in your city where you're expected to whisper when you walk in there. Mm -hmm. And in any given town, you're expected to whisper when you walk in a church building, when you walk in a bank, or when you walk in a hospital or a library. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with education, religion, medicine, and, uh, and finance. Those are the houses of the idols. That It's like God is, God is moving, and he's going to bring the idols into a, a place of exposure where you're going to know that the Lord our God, he is one God, and not all of these other things. And notice what Pharaoh did. He said, now you men go worship God. You leave your little ones, your wives, and your cattle behind. But notice God's plan. God does not compromise with the enemy. That, that spirit in your life, that, that person, that situation that doesn't want to let you go, they might say, look, you just keep your religion with your religion and leave your kids alone. I, I know people who feel like they have an absolute on-time relationship with God, but they won't even mention the Word of God to their children because their traditions are we let them make up their own mind if those kids grow up to, to, to serve false gods. Well, that's their decision. We're not going to encroach upon that. In other words, serve your God, but leave your kids out of it. Mm. And that's what the public schools, that's what education is saying. Go ahead and serve your God, but leave your kids out of it. As a matter of fact, if you push your, your faith, if you try to inculcate your faith into your children's lives to a certain point, law enforcement will step in. You can be sure of it. And it's happening all across this country and here in the United States today. Go ahead and serve your God. And even in, in Muslim countries, you can be a Christian, but don't you dare share your faith. Hmm. See, it's okay. Go ahead and serve God, but just leave everybody else out of it. But notice that's the spirit of Pharaoh. But here's what God says and what Moses says. We're coming out with our wives. Mm -hmm. We're coming out with our marriages intact. 
We're coming out with our children and, he said, and our grandchildren. You don't have to give up the, the, your grandchildren. That's right. You're, they said, we're coming out with our cattle, and cattle back then, that was their income. We're coming out with our economy. Go ahead and be a Christian, just be poor. The medieval church took, the church in the Middle Ages took a vow of, of poverty that is, is a curse on the church today. It's amazing. You could find a, a Christian that cries at the altar every Sunday, and he's just giddy when his favorite sports figure is, is making an obscene salary, uh, but if his pastor wants a raise, well, he just gets offended because you're supposed to keep your preacher poor. That is, a, that is the spirit of the vow of poverty, whereby mm -hmm. the Jesus. enemy is robbing the people of God from the economy that is theirs. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it said the people in Egypt laid them down with gold and silver and wealth. There is a transfer of the wealth in the earth. The prophets Amen. have been saying it for 30 years. Amen. But before it comes, there's going to have to be a real repentance among people where money is concerned. Uh, people get a... We get a, people come at us all the time, as they do with all preachers and ministries, about, about why we take donations and why don't we just give all of our resources away for free, which we probably give away more than we don't. And uh, the Lord just told me, he says, where their tra he said, you don't want those kind of people anywhere near you. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we want people that are with us because we're with them. Amen. We're investing of ourselves, giving of ourselves, and we want people around us that are invested because their hearts are with us. Money can come from anywhere, That's right. but you cannot, you cannot buy someone's heart. Mm -hmm. And Jesus himself said that when people in, are investing of their resources, it's a sign that their hearts are with you. And, uh, and we want people that, we want to be connected with people whose hearts are in it. We don't want to be around people that are hypocritical who you don't know whether you could trust them one moment they're, they're out, of, out of your sight. And so we've, we've uh, configured our ministry to where it discourages people that have that spirit of poverty. Mm -hmm. they, they're going to get humble themselves and get free of it and get blessed. Mm -hmm. But if they're just so bound by their religious thinking that they're not willing to change their mind, then, then they're not, we're not ready for them. We're not what they need or they're not ready for us or some uh, version of, of both. But the Spirit of God is speaking today. And the, the word of the Lord today is the same as it was uh, in Moses' day, let my people go. In Revelations chapter 11 verse 8, Jesus is speaking to John the Revelator in a vision, and he calls Jerusalem, he said, the, the great city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Now, you know, I understand we're advocates, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but that's not all there is to Jerusalem. There is a... Hello. Hello. There is a side to what Jerusalem represents that rejects God and rejects the things of God. And I believe what it's really saying is not so much the geographical city of Jerusalem as it is the spirit of religion. Mm -hmm. The spirit of religion in the earth. What is the thing about Sodom? Sodom deals with homosexuality, which is people of the same gender coming coming together in an inordinate way. What does that look like spiritually? There's a such thing as spiritual uh, sodomy, is where we have people come together and we're not going to gather together unless you're just like me. If you're not just like me, I'm not going to church with you. We're going to reject any church that's not just like us. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why the church is being overthrown by the LGBT lobby is because they are a physical representation of a lot of what happens in religious circles that says you have to be just like us. You have to be spiritually the same gender as us. Believe what we do. Look what we do. Be exactly like we are or we're not going to walk with you. We're not going to even consider you a Christian. And it's the same spirit. It's just like the scripture says in um, the Old Testament law. It said that someone who was a homosexual would not enter in 
to the presence of God to his tenth generation. And again, and we have to remember that these things must be spiritually understood as well as looked at in their natural applications. Well, there's a spirit of spiritual sodomy in religion today that says, you have to be just like me or I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And so that's the only connection. Why would he call Jerusalem Sodom in Revelation 11.8? I believe that's what he's referring to. And it's something that has to be broken. It's something that we have to get free from. And we have to do that by not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but partaking of the tree of life. And, uh, and being willing, like Jesus, the spirit of Pharaoh in Jesus' day was wrapped up in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you aren't letting people enter into the kingdom, and you won't let anybody else enter in. You're putting burdens on the people, and you won't lift one of those burdens with your little finger. Mm -hmm. And it's the same spirit today. People being held in bondage by religion and not being allowed to walk in their freedom in God. And, and just as it was in Jesus' day, just as it was in Moses' day, the Father is saying, let my people go. It's time for the people of God to lose their religion and to find their spiritual focus. Find their spiritual anchor and begin to walk with God and let people have their own walk with God that empowers them and activates them in their des destiny instead of holding them locked up in sheep sheds and say, you just come here and sit and everything's going to be okay. And if you're not here, I've heard pe preachers say that. If you leave this church, oh dear. you're going to go out and get hit by a train crossing a railroad track and go out into eternity because you're not under our covering. That is such a prevalent spirit. We, we see the spiritual people as the ones coming into the church and the backslidden ones as the ones that quit coming. And that was a curse and of death right there. That kind of thinking Hello? has to go. Yes, we need, we need our pastors and we need our churches. We need to stay out of the rain, not get sunburned when we come together and worship. Mm -hmm. But people need to be liberated into their destiny in God. And the Spirit of God is saying over the earth today, let my people go. And guess what? He's going to have his way. And you and I are going to get to participate in it. Let's just make sure that we wind up on the blessing side of God's sovereignty and not like the 18 men that died in the book of, in Acts chapter 12 who when may have been good men but they just wound up on the wrong side of the sovereignty of God when he was setting a man free like the Apostle Peter. So you think about that and we're looking forward to coming back tomorrow with Exodus chapter 11. So Father we thank you for what we're understanding day by day. We thank you for the revelation that comes Father, I pray that you would just um, cause our hunger for you. You know it's big. You know that um, you know that we are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. You promised that while we're doing that, we are being filled. I just pray that you would enlarge our capacity for you so that we just absolutely ooze out our pores, the glory of God and the life of God, and there, thereby create a revival everywhere we walk because the glory is so full on the inside of us. Help us to give an answer to every person about the joy that's within us, the hope that we have this day, because we're looking to a better land. We're looking to the promised land of the kingdom daily. We don't have to go through um, the, the degradation of plagues in our life. We can just look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and go there. Let's just go there, Father, to that place called there in the promised land of the kingdom of God today. And we bless you for it. We thank you for these precious times together. And we ask that you bless our brothers and sisters who listen with us. In Jesus' name, amen.